I am officially calling the um, business meeting of the spring business meeting of the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation to order. And we just established a quorum, no proxies. And I hereby appoint Shayla Shreves as recorder for the meeting. Um, want to welcome all of you to the to this meeting and thank you for enduring one more virtual business meeting. Hopefully uh, the next one won't be virtual uh, and we will have a full time chair. So uh, let's see where that where that takes us. Um, Shayla, may I call upon you to do a roll call of the members? Certainly, Mr. Vice Chairman, um, just <clears throat> say here if you are here. Uh, John Finley. Here. John Fry. He was not here. Rick Gonzalez. Here. Christopher King. I think he might not be here. Okay, Luke Nichter. Here. Jay Vote. Present. Reno Franklin. Here. Mayor Robert Simison. Here. Architect of the Capitol, Brett Blanton. Here. And I saw him, okay. Um, Sandy Watts from USDA. I'm here. Great, Caroline Henry from DOI. Here. Richard Kidd from DOD. Did I see Richard? Not yet, okay. Um, Tom Chalecki, Homeland Security. Here. And Teresa Pullman, Homeland Security. I thought I saw both of them. I'm uh, here. Kevin Bush from HUD. Here. Okay. Um, Christopher Coase from DOT. <clears throat> Not yet, I see Colleen from DOT. <laughs> yes, I'm representing Christopher today. Okay, thank you, Colleen. Uh, Michael Brennan from VA. Not yet. Okay. Beth Savage from GSA. Present. Paul Edmondson from the National Trust. Here. Okay. Ramona Bartos from Nick Shippo. Present. Son, Ramona and Eric Hine. I saw him too. There we go. Um, Shasta Gone from NAFPO. Here. I see Shasta, okay. And is Valerie Grusing with us too? Present. Okay, hello ladies. And Vice Chairman Jordan Tannenbaum, I certainly saw you. Definitely here, for sure. And uh, Stephanie <laughs> Paul from NAPC, did I see Stephanie? And our observers, uh, Catherine Slick from the Foundation. Here. And Ann Walker from the Preserve America Youth Summits. Not quite here yet. Okay. Okay, that is our list, Mr. Vice Chairman. All right. Thank you, Ms. Recorder. And now we shall go on to um, adopting our agenda, but I need some help. I need someone to make a motion and I need someone to second that motion. So I make a I'll motion. Move. Oh, I'll second. Okay. And um, I'm going to wave the roll call here. Uh, Sheila, and let's just do a uh, voice vote, okay? So all those in favor of adopting the agenda, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, the ayes have it. And now a second time, you are great. Let's see if we can keep it up. I need a motion and a second to adopt the minutes from the December business meeting. So moved. Okay, thank you, and a second. Second. Okay, great, and now a voice vote again. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Can't imagine. Who are you? Great. Okay. Now <laughs> we know where you live. All right. Good. <laughs> Both carry. Um, so <clears throat> I am going to briskly move to the first item, the vice chair's welcome. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Uh, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have a full agenda, and uh, I want to make sure that all of you uh, get get on your way by four o'clock. So uh, that is my one of my main responsibilities to manage the time. Uh, I have an hourglass here and that should just work fine. 
Um, let me do a, a brief overview of what I have been doing <clears throat> uh, as I have been performing the duties of chairman since our last meeting. And I have been one busy beaver, one busy acting chairman. Um, let me share with you just a couple and I'll discuss some of them uh, in greater detail later on or others will talk about them, some of the staff. But uh, let me begin by talking about the Climate Change Task Force. Uh, I have been chairing this since its inception uh, and I continue to chair it. <clears throat> and um, we have had a number of meetings, uh, the most recent one just last week, March 23rd, um, I really find these very, very valuable, and I think the engagement that is created is terrific. Uh, and um, later on in the agenda, I will be giving you some of the particulars that are going on there. But this has uh, been a, a terrific, terrific uh, group as we've come together. <clears throat> I've also participated in a number of tribal listening sessions. Um, I was uh, honored to represent the advisory council in a listening section session couple actually with, uh, with leaders from Indian tribes and native Hawaiian organizations headed by the inimitable uh, unsinkable Reno Franklin and the newly installed and terrifically accomplished Ira Matt of our Office of Native American Affairs uh, to get input on our action plan and you'll hear more about that as we as we go through the agenda as well. But it, it basically, uh, that action plan addresses the impacts of climate change on sites that are important to tribes and native Hawaiian organizations. Um, leadership, I really, leadership, the leadership, Reno, I really appreciate your leadership uh, in these sessions. You've been terrific. Uh, and I know you're going to have a lot more to say on that uh, as we go, go through the agenda. Also, Ira, Terrific, terrific uh, leadership yourself with jumping right in. Of course, you've had a lot of experience in this area and it shows. Uh, and um, I'm just very pleased. And every time I get a chance to, uh, to say this and to promote what we're doing with the, uh, considering the views of tribes and native Hawaiian organizations, we also talk about Pacific Islanders on occasion and Alaska. Um, uh, native governments. Uh, anytime we can do that, I feel really good about that. I think that's important. I think we are establishing our leadership in this field, and it's a most important field. So um, moving on, I have represented the council in an organization, very important organization called the Federal Permitting Improvement Steering Council, or its acronym FIPSI. And um, we have we met also uh, recently. Um, we um, did a couple of things there. We added um, and we removed some sectors. Um, and uh, I'm joined, by the way, by, by uh, really members at the highest level of government in this. Um, and that was something that needed to be done. Um, also, uh, I have used my presence in this body to advocate for more support. Um, Eric uh, for SHBOs and Valerie for THBOs on infrastructure reviews. Uh, very important a topic that I that we stress whenever we can. Uh, and um, Jay will talk a little bit more about that later in the meeting. So th let me end with another uh, group that I met with recently last week, the America the Beautiful Working Group. Uh, and I was able to share the views of some listening sessions that took place uh, uh, with this group. Um, and, I, and they seemed very, very interested. Um, this, has been a, this has been a lot of fun. It's again, an, an organization, a group that is um, peopled by the secretaries of departments um, and, uh, and they take it and all of the members take this very, very seriously. And, and again, it's at the highest level of, of government. That's where the advisory council wants to be. I'm delighted that we, that we are there. It's, and the whole area of climate change is, is very important personally. So this is, this is a great opportunity for me personally and for our organization. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the things that I shared with them later. Um, but um, I, I believe that we were very well received uh, and some of the, uh, uh, Reed, I think, Drew, you might've been on that too, so you can verify. And if, if I wasn't well received, don't tell me, please. I don't want to know. <laughs> so, okay. All right. As I said, we got a full agenda, so I'm going to keep on moving. 
Uh, and uh, let me at this point turn to Reed for the executive director's report. Reed, take it away. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. I appreciate your report and can attest to all of the members that you are doing nearly a full-time chairman's level of work uh, as a part-time chair. And I really appreciate your leadership. I think we all benefit from it and your engagement and your insights. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm happy to update you all on a number of issues that uh, um, are uh, of, of general interest and, and specific interest in a number of circumstances. First, uh, I wanted to just acknowledge, I think, news that you're all aware of, but it bears uh, acknowledging one more time that Professor Sarah Bronin was once again reported out favorably for a second time by the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee um, regarding uh, the president's nomination for her in the position of chairman. Um, that was referred once again uh, favorably to the full Senate. And as we were uh, you know, in this situation a few months ago, we once again wait for the full Senate to vote on her nomination. Um, I also wanted to talk about uh, quite a few personnel changes in the ACHP since we last spoke in December. Frankly, when I tallied them up, it was sort of an unprecedented number of new hires just in a three or four month period uh, from our last meeting in mid-December. So I wanted to just um, uh, acknowledge and mention a number of new hires and uh, give a few of them a chance to wave hello to you all. First, I'm really pleased to announce that uh, Megan Borthwick joined the ACHP just two days ago um, as our new liaison to the Army, replacing Rachel Mangum, who transferred to a program analyst position in FPLAS. Um, please, uh, Megan, if you're on, uh, you can uncloak and, and be on uh, screen here. Well, I'm guessing you're not a panelist. Now that I realize it, you probably can't. So um, at any rate, let me just go on and say that Megan is a graduate of the University of Oregon's Historic Preservation Master's Program, and she worked previously at the Historic Hawaii Foundation, as well as the Hawaii SHPO, where her primary duties were Section 106 reviews and the National Register program. Since 2018, Megan was as served as the Historic Compliance Coordinator at the Presidio Trust in San Francisco. So we're delighted to have Megan on board as our new Army liaison. I also wanted to welcome Rain Blanks, who joined our Office of General Counsel at the end of January as our, our new government information specialist. She comes to the ACHP after most recently being a consultant to the BLM. Uh, and with over 10 years of FOIA and project, man project management experience. Um, in OGC, she will primarily handle our FOIA requests and related work as well as certain personnel functions. And I know we're delighted to have her on board handling those as well. So welcome, Rain. Um, I also wanted to uh, welcome Jamie Lee Marks, uh, who joined our Office of Native American Affairs as a senior program analyst, filling the position that Ira Matt vacated when I prom promoted him to the position of director. Jamie Lee will be supporting the ACHP through work with the White House Council on Native American Affairs and also assisting us with a variety of initiatives and interagency working groups. She has served as the former manager of the National Tribal Historic Preservation Program at the Park Service, as a tribal liaison at the Park Service, as an external affairs officer at FEMA, and as a transportation anthropologist at FTA. So welcome, Jamie Lee. Uh, I also want to uh, welcome Awani Williams, who is a citizen of the Bishop Paiute tribe from Central Eastern California. Awani will be at, or already has returned to the ACHP and the Office of Native American Affairs as our Native American program assistant, where she'll be supporting uh, staff and working with ONA staff on climate change, traditional knowledge, and Native youth initiatives, to name a few things. Uh, Awani had previously worked for the ACHP as an intern in 2021, and she's currently working on her bachelor's degree in tribal historic preservation at Salish Kootenai College. So welcome back again, Awani. We're very uh, glad to have you all. 
Um, I also wanted to just update you on some, I think some impressive recruitment statistics, um, specifically relating to our intern program. The ACHP received 114 applications for our FY 2022 summer internship programs, by far the highest number ever. Um, we will be hosting six paid summer interns, three full-time and three half-time, 100% increase over FY 2021. All will be virtual internships. And um, I'm also pleased to acknowledge that an analysis of the applications suggests that we have had a significant increase in the diversity of applicants due in part to these broadened efforts. So let me end that brief report by thanking the foundation genuinely for their support for this program. Um, it's, uh, the program is impressive and gets even more so every year. So thank you to the foundation for that. I wanted to just also acknowledge that we will have an intern uh, hopefully from the Salish Kootenai College as well, and that we'll continue to host one week externs in our Office of Communication, Education and Outreach um, through participation in the Riley program um, at Rutgers University. So very pleased to, um, uh, to announce all those personnel changes. I will just also acknowledge that we are very close to having on board a new liaison with the Department of Veterans Affairs. So. Lots going on on the personnel front, um, and I think we've got a great team and it's getting bigger and better all the time. Um, I also wanna just uh, say a few words about budgets. Um, uh, first of all, let me just mention uh, regarding the FY 2022 appropriations. We and all other federal agencies, for the most part, just finally received our full appropriation for FY 2022, obviously well into the fiscal year. Uh, but um, I just wanted to acknowledge that us now having received those full appropriations allows us to do a number of things that we have been waiting to do for some time. Um, as you might recall, we received a significant increase in our budget in FY 2022, and we will now be able to really begin implementing some desperately needed and very important IT upgrades and cybersecurity upgrades as well as adding one more position to our Office of Federal Agency Programs. That budget included a new position to the ACHPR Digital Operations Coordinator. Um, and that'll be a, a full-time permanent position in OFAP that will work to improve um, you know, electronic Section 106 procedures both within the ACHP and working with external partners, states and tribes and others to help them improve their electronic E106 and information system. So we're very excited to begin uh, the process of adding that person. I also wanted to just acknowledge um, now that the president has sent his budget to the Hill that our FY 2023 budget justification is posted on our website and it includes an additional 4% increase over this year's funding. It's a 4% that will allow us, um, you know, with our fingers crossed that Congress will fund it, uh, but should they fund it at the level requested, um, it will allow us to add yet another position to the ACHP, an equity officer, um, a very important position that we think will be instrumental in helping us address um, equity and diversity issues, both internal to the ACHP, but also working externally with outreach, education, and assistance to help others, particularly those carrying out Section 106 reviews, make sure that they are reaching underserved um, uh, communities and environmental justice communities and that their Section 106 consultation and general outreach is as broad and as inclusive as possible. So some positive news on the budget front and uh, fingers crossed that it'll continue to be positive and, FY 2023. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman, for that chance to, to report to you all, and I'll take any questions if you have them. Any questions for the hour? in progress. Hello? Hello? Any questions? Any questions? All right. All right. Uh, Oops. Oops. Getting some feedback some here. Feedback here. Okay, that's better. Thank you, whoever. Yes, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, I don't see it, uh, any 
John, John, no. Okay, don't see any questions. So we're moving on uh, to orient you. We are moving briskly into Roman numeral three, the strategic plan, something you're all familiar with because we've been talking about it for a while. And we talked about it most recently in our December meeting. Uh, and uh, you may recall it was this was technically due in February, but of course we've been given some leeway because we're still um, uh, waiting for our full time chairman. Um, also, probably some leeway because we worked on this just a couple of years ago, so it's uh, it's still pretty it it, it the uh, it's still within the date stamp uh, on this, and it has not expired yet. And and so we've been um, looking at some adjustments. Uh, I want to thank all the committees because everybody had a crack at this. Everybody looked at the plan and made some suggestions uh, that they felt might be necessary. Um, uh, Drew Null uh, led this, uh, this, this particular project, did a terrific job. Uh, and um, we've attempted to, to address and to respond to the, to the comments that were made. Um, to get into this in greater detail, I'd like to turn to Rick Gonzalez and Drew uh, to briefly report on the committee's discussion of these revisions to the strategic plan uh, and summarize any adjustments that staff made to address these comments and as well as any suggestions that came out of yesterday's meeting and um, you know, remind uh, all of you too that if you want to take a look at the strategic plan, it can be found in tab one of the meeting book. So, uh, Rick and Drew, okay. take it away. Thank you, Jordan, and hello, everybody. Happy, happy Wednesday. <laughs> um, the PI committee we met yesterday afternoon. As always, lots of thanks to Drew for making my job so easy as a, as a committee chair. Um, we did propose some edits uh, to the revised strategic plan that, that you can find in the uh, meeting book. And the edits address several preservation related issues and really three key areas of focus of the uh, Biden administration. And they include uh, equity, uh, the interests of Indian tribes and native Hawaiians and climate change. And so I'd like to see, Drew, uh, would you like to add anything else to that? Yeah, I mean, obviously you all have had a chance to look at the document, but just to expand a little bit, give you a little bit more context for the, the changes that um, Rick is alluding to. Um, in terms of equity issues, there are references, um, new references to equity and inclusion and underserved communities um, at various points in the document as appropriate. And also there is a new uh, proposed strategic objective in section three of the plan um, it addresses the fact that currently the ACHP's recognition programs, like the awards programs, are not actually mentioned in the plan. So it corrects that, but it also is an opportunity to emphasize that engaging more diverse audiences um, and underserved communities through our recognition programs is a strategic goal or strate strategic objective. Um, regarding um, beefing up the focus on the interests of Indian tribes and Native Hawaiians, um, there is now a reference to traditional knowledge that's been added, is proposed, um, and also acknowledging um, tribal and Native Hawaiian interest in traditional cultural places and sacred sites. So they have not; they were not actually called out specifically in the current version of the plan. So they would be under the proposed changes, as well as rec as having as a, as a strategic goal. Um, that the ACHP participate in initiatives that, like we are now with the White House Council on Native American Affairs. Regarding climate change, there in the current plan was already a reference to climate change in the context of working of the ACHP working with federal agencies on their programs and projects. Uh, but now there's a new proposed strategic objective in section four uh, in the context of preservation policy. Uh, that, we thought we heard we're hearing from you all that the, there was a need to add that there a to beef up uh, the climate change aspects of the plan and also to recognize that the climate change uh, and historic preservation task force is going to be looking broadly at climate issues so it needs to have its own um, own strategic objective in the plan and then there are um, a, as rick alluded to a couple of preservation related policy issues that have been um, inserted in response to what we were hearing from you all um, we, uh, there's a reference to affordable housing as a key issue that we'd be look at, uh, looking at. 
Um, also that we would, that the ACHP would be advising Congress on federal funding for SHPOs and TIPOs, and also a reference to America 250, since of course, as this plan lasts for a number of years, with each passing year, we get closer to the semi-quincentennial. So that kind of in a nutshell it reflects the changes. And as, um, as Rick said, in response to um, discussion that we had yesterday, um, we have an additional edit um, to suggest. Um, basically, um, I'll turn it back to, uh, to you, Rick, to talk a little bit more about that. Obviously, I'll be happy to answer any questions as we continue in the discussion here. I see some hands up now. Do you, do you all, how would you like to handle that? Do you want to wait uh, until the end to answer further questions or? Mr. Uh, Jordan, would you like us to wait now or take the questions now? Uh, why don't you go through your, your additional because there may, and then yeah. we'll do the questions then. Okay. okay, we also had general consensus in the PI committee uh, to support these uh, recommended changes. However, there was a discussion regarding a more editing of the plan and acknowledging the work with federal agencies to improve effectiveness and efficiency of the section 106 uh, with our SHPO's input and our TPHO inputs. Um, I think Drew, you might have a shared page here that, uh, that you can share yeah. with us. Yeah, let me share our, my screen and scroll it down a bit. So you can see the whole thing, hold on. There you go. So this addition um, is to reflect, is to address this issue that was brought up yesterday, that while we work with, as the plan acknowledges, we work with federal agencies to try to tailor 106 and improve efficiency and effectiveness, we do that working with the states uh, and tribes and other stakeholders. So while that we, while that's uh, self-evident to all of us, to a cold reader, it wouldn't be so, and, and it needs to be emphasized. So we were suggesting this additional edit to deal with that. Great, great. Okay, let's take questions at this point. Questions, if we can. We have Betsy and Chris. Yeah. Uh, Betsy. Uh, you might be muted. Betsy? Uh, while Betsy is getting unmuted, let's try Chris. I know that was a mistake. I did not mean to raise my hand. So. Ah, okay. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> Betsy made a mistake too. Um, Betsy, are you on yet? Can you hear me now? Y yes, now we can uh, hear you. Yeah. Mine was a mistake also. Chris and I both did the same thing. I apologize. <laughs> okay, well, this meeting isn't a mistake, is it? No, just kidding. Okay, no, we're real. We're real. Okay, very good. So are there any questions at all? Because I'd like to move with um, some, some, um, some action on this item, if we could. Uh, uh, not seeing any hands up. Uh, let's let's move forward. So um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Rick and uh, and Drew for you know for your for your uh, description uh, and um, and and for your adding in late breaking news uh, in terms of this in this particular item. Um, and I think uh, most not hearing any questions uh, and not hearing any disagreement, which is even more important in this particular case where we're headed. Um, and I think most of the changes are, are minor in nature. Uh, so what Jordan, I'd like to do- I'm sorry, Jordan, if I may interrupt. It looks like yes. Eric does have a- does Oh, have I'm a, sorry. Eric. <laughs> sorry, that sorry mistake, no, wasn't I, I, I just <laughs> wanted to thank you home. all for um, including and making that change. Um, <laughs> that was something that we had asked for. So thank you very much. Great, 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 great. Oh yeah, the team is is on the ball here. Really, uh, <laughs> very, very current. That's great. Okay, so look, I, we don't know when Professor Bronin is going to be confirmed, and what I'd like to do, we hope that it'll be soon. I certainly hope it'll be soon. But, <laughs> but uh, in the uh, in the meantime, I, I think, and I'm inclined to finalize uh, and adopt the plan. Uh, under your under you know my my authority right now as the acting chair, so I would like to um, 
unless there are any disagreement with this, uh, I would like to get approval for our strategic plan from this body. Uh, and um, in the event that uh, when she comes on, Professor Bronin uh, has some issues or feels it needs further revision, we can always accommodate that, right, Reed? I don't think we should have any problems there. Okay, all right. Correct. It so, can easily so. be amended and updated. Absolutely. Okay, good, good. All right, so given that, the fact that I'd like to, to uh, finish uh, this particular item uh, and get it approved, um, let me just ask, are there any comments from the members on the revised draft as we begin to move into a voting mode? Okay, hearing none, then I would like to um, vote on this. However, um, this is going to be a, um, a, a, a roll call vote, correct? Uh, no, we, we can do it as a voice vote. We can do it a voice vote. Yeah. Okay, great. Good. Then let's do it as a voice vote. All those uh, approving of this say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Okay. Any? Wait, do you need a motion? I think we need yeah. a motion. I'm, I'm sorry. And a Mr. Second. Chairman, this yes. is Reno. I would make the uh, I would make the motion to approve. Okay. Okay. Very good, Reno. Thank you. Thank you. Moving along a little too fast. Uh, and do we have a second? I'll second. Okay. This is Shasta. All right. Thank you. Then let me say um, all those are, that are in favor of this motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? And the motion carries. Okay. Excellent. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, and, um, and, and Drew Rick, thanks a lot again for your uh, thank you. description here. Okay. We are now moving on to item four, climate change and historic preservation. Uh, as I mentioned just a little while ago, um, regarding the Climate Change Task Force, we've had uh, several very important and very productive meetings since December when we last met as a, as a um, council, uh, uh, one just last week. Uh, Reno, thank you again for your leadership on this issue. Uh, and would you be able to report right now uh, briefly on particularly on the engagement with Indian tribes and Native Hawaiian organizations and what we heard from them in our listing session. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, let me just go to my notes here. And um, fortunately, the, uh, the laptop gods are being kind to me right now, and that's not always the case. So uh, yeah, real happy about that one. Um, so, Jordan, which one did you want me to report out on? Uh, climate change, I believe? Climate change task force, yeah, if you could. Okay. No problem. I have those notes right here. And then if I click this button and don't cuss, it gets me right to where I want to be at. Yay, okay. So we did, uh, you know, so there was a, a larger session, um, you know, the, the White House uh, Council of Native American Affairs. And as, as you know, um, Mr. Vice Chairman, we have, uh, we have been engaged in that. Uh, and uh, and done quite a bit of outreach uh, along with uh, the uh, the uh, administration and and uh, and that group uh, that working group. Which I think it was like 23 of us on that call, numerous tribes. Um, so just to kind of give you a little bit um, high level uh, of the feedback that we got, um, there was a uh, you know the the tribes and Native Hawaiian organizations felt that there was a lack of agency level planning and resource allocation, uh, something that you know. Um, uh, helps helps uh, tribes and native Hawaiians as we can move move into uh, climate change adaption and uh, and resilience. Um, questions around data acquisition and uh, and confidentiality. So there was a lot of a lot of uh, discussion. You know, Freedom uh, of Information Act requests, uh, and data breaches uh, that that things that have been shared in the past, and um, both tribes and native Hawaiian organizations having some, some concerns around that. Um, Management issues and general concerns, you know, uh, just um, there, there's there's times where uh, or um, some projects that are related to this uh, and tribes are consulted um, later in the process than tribes want it to be. Um, you know, it's not there was a lack of uh, consistency amongst federal agencies when, when they are consulting. Um, and uh, and it kind of you know, it was, it was interesting to hear some of those things get raised because you know, we hear that in, uh, in other things, you know, um, not just uh, in, around uh, climate change and, and uh, the effects to sacred sites, what, what could happen there um, in, in as programs are developed. So, but some, some similar um, threads of, uh, 
of concerns from tribes. Um, and then, uh, and then finally, you know, there there also was a it was nice to hear um, just ways that tribes were coming up Native Hawaiians for uh, potential improvement. Native Hawaii seemed to be really concerned as as uh, climate change is you know uh, raising uh, the sea levels and uh, and their their seawalls have to go up and you know and really I'm concerned about what that process looks like for them and uh, you know and it being over regulated uh, with to to raise um, historic seawalls and so it was kind of interesting points that were were really being uh, made all the way around so um, you know climate change uh, it, it's a it's a big issue in in Indian country where we're all talking about it you know um, as as wildfires happen and, and erosion and you know the, uh, our plants and our animal communities are, are the way that they're affected so um, really a lot of a lot of conversations that are being had right now um, in the overall climate change uh, conversations about planning and preparations is just huge. Uh, and I think that uh, NAPO has taken, done a good job of taking some leadership there, as well as the administration is doing that now. Um, but uh, the, the funding for emergency response question keeps coming up again and again in, in, the, in the field of historic preservation. You know, and, and we see it, you know, <clears throat> the devastating uh, hurricanes that hit Puerto Rico and, um, you know, uh, the tornado that hit New Orleans, which just, <laughs> you know, and, and these fires that are just ripping across the uh, the Midwest to the West, all the way to the Pacific Northwest. And so there's you know, just the concerns around um, what the funding looks like for, for GIS and mapping ahead of that, um, you know, and, and additional grants uh, for tribes to, to get, get um, training to their uh, field people and get the TIPOs red carded. And that, that's, that's a really big thing. It, every, every TIPO at this point should have somebody on their staff that's red carded and can go out and assist with uh, um, avoidance during fires. Uh, and uh, finally, you know, um, the discussions continue to go on with tribal and uh, Native Hawaiian knowledge, that traditional uh, knowledge, which uh, we, we are now hearing in indigenous traditional knowledge and uh, indigenous traditional ecological knowledge and how we're going to incorporate those um, into uh, climate change responses, um, you know, and how we can uh, incorporate the, the words of our traditional practitioners uh, when we are needing to do um, projects that are related to uh, climate resiliency. So I uh, hope that sums it up good enough for you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Happy to take any questions if you'd like me to, or uh, pet my cat and just walk away, whatever you'd like. Uh, no, don't walk away. Stay, please, <laughs> please. There's a lot of a lot of good stuff to come. Uh, so um, thank you, thanks a lot, Reno. Um, any questions for Reno? I'd like Drew if you'd also jump in and give a brief summary of, of what we accomplished and when when we might convene again. Yes, um, basically, the, as I believe you mentioned, Mr. Vice Chair, um, the committee, the task force has met three times already, and we're going to be meeting again in May. The group decided, not on a specific date yet, but that there will be in the, the next meeting will be in May. Um, in addition to the uh, discussion of um, Indian tribe and Native Hawaiian um, issues and concerns and um, interests and the climate action plan, Native climate action plan, um, which took up quite a bit of the last meeting, Couple of just to give you highlights of a couple other things that the um, task force has looked at over its meetings. Um, it took a look at the potential implications for historic properties of one of the recent executive orders that have been issued, Executive Order um, 14057, which is called Catalyzing Clean Energy Industries and Jobs Through Federal Sustainability. And the reason that the committee wanted to, the task force wanted to take a look at that is because one of the goals of the executive order is net zero emissions from federal buildings, campuses, and installations. And um, following a presentation um, by Beth Savage from GSA about GSA's um, knowledge of the executive order and how it probably will be panning out, uh, I'm pleased to report the consensus is that this net zero target is not in and of itself probably going to be a major, um, uh, a major problem for the retention and preservation of historic properties in, in the federal portfolio. Um, we also, the task force also uh, chewed on for a while the whole issue of staffing capacity in um, light of the upcoming uh, influx of projects that are going to result from the infrastructure bill. Um, basically, 
and you all will be hearing more about this during uh, the discussion of uh, from the FAP uh, committee later in um, later in the meeting. But basically, as you all know, there's just this is going to be a tsunami of projects. It's going to be difficult for states and tribes uh, to handle the influx. So while the task force didn't come to any conclusions about that, we obviously are very concerned um, about the impact on climate related on projects that are dealing with climate change, but also the tsunami of pro infrastructure projects um, that might be involved with clean energy production and the impacts that those could have on historic properties. And then lastly, um, there's been a lot of discussion about in the task force about the need for training and guidance um, and the need for the uh, ACHP to um, to decide what audiences and in what ways we can help contribute to making the federal uh, workforce more climate literate in terms of historic properties, but also uh, to the extent that we can help other stakeholders as well. So I think that's going to be a key uh, focus area moving forward, uh, probably in the next couple of meetings uh, to discuss where we go with uh, training and guidance. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Happy to answer any questions. Okay, any questions for Drew? Okay, hearing none. Um, you know, I always like to add a little personal items in, in, in my remarks. So, um, Drew, we have nothing, you have nothing to fear if the floods come, because I know that you are an experienced kayaker, having, <laughs> having right. kayaked with you a number of times when we taught the council course together. So you're all set not to work. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks for everybody for, um, uh, for your broad interest in this issue. Uh, let's move on to the America the Beautiful uh, uh, discussion uh, and um, a meeting that I took, uh, took part in uh, just on the 21st of March, so just recently. Um, and this is really an important, as they're all important, but this is a particularly important part of our efforts to address climate change and where we're addressing it. And this group um, you know, you do have, we have a lot of agencies, but we are also on every one of the calls I've been on, we have the secretaries of the interior, agriculture, commerce, and the chair of the council on environmental quality um, uh, attending. And so that's really important that we're getting that kind of, uh, that kind of involvement and visibility. Um, and so just let me share a, a couple of uh, things that I went over with them, and then I will turn it over to Drew to report uh, more comprehensively perhaps on what happened there. But um, let me just mention that I, I um, so this was, this was where I reported on the four listening sessions that we've had, two with Native American groups, two with um, groups that were interested in preservation advocates and, uh, uh, and other folks in that, in that category. Um, and, um, you know, it, I think it was, uh, again, it was important that they invited us, invited me to, uh, and the council, therefore, to participate uh, because of the level at which we are, we are involved here. Um, we did in January send a letter to, uh, to this group tell, highlighting some of the results of the listening sessions, but my principal job was to go over some of the things that we heard. Uh, and um, right off the bat, made uh, the case that you know, then when we talk about natural landscapes, we speak of uh, we are also speaking about cultural landscapes. That's very, very important, and cultural values along with natural values. Um, talked a little bit about wilderness areas and some of the uh, issues there that um, challenge uh, access sometimes to. Uh, uh, cultural resources, particularly sacred sites, and, and, uh, and sometimes neglect them or remove them. Um, talked a lot about um, some of the, um, the groups that are involved in this area. Uh, and uh, I think some of them were, it was, you know, first time that they were, had to come in contact with some of these. Uh, and the importance of, um, of, of leading by example. Um, another theme I talked about was the, I pointed out that we had discussed with a number of communities and the importance of communities in this particular area, uh, cultural resources, uh, and and the and some of the views that we got from local residents. Uh, I think uh, they might have been surprised also by some of the historic property types that I mentioned that could be uh, kind of grouped into the whole area of uh, of of 
natural uh, of conservation, which is really another that's really a foundational concept in this area that um, you know what is conservation and how does it involve other kinds of properties talked about uh, urban suburban parks they talked about battlefields working farms. Uh, uh, linear features canals uh, trails things like that. Uh, and and then I talked about the impact on archaeological resources from permafrost melt, erosion, wildfire, some of the things that Reno's has talked about, uh, and um, uh, and as I said, grappled with the the whole area of uh, a definition of of conservation and where cultural resources properly fit in that particular definition. Um, finally, I, I went over some of the. Um, uh, the importance of pr protection of these resources, these fragile resources, talked a little bit about uh, that in, in the context of something called the American Conservation and Stewardship Atlas, which is a major project of this particular group. Uh, so uh, as I said, they seem to be interested, and Reed has already uh, agreed that that was the case. Uh, and, um, uh, and I look forward to the next meeting of this group. Uh, it was an important opportunity for us, an important uh, uh, place for us to make these considerations known uh, and on the table. So any questions about that before I turn it over to Drew, who will fill in what I left out? Um, any questions? Drew. Um, I, I certainly can't add anything to your description of, of your <laughs> talk uh, with, with the principles. It was uh, a really important opportunity at that highest level uh, to be a voice. I mean, we are basically the voice uh, for cultural resources as part of this initiative. So it was a great opportunity. Um, at the staff level, we're also actively engaged. We've um, been made a member of the, they have a series of committees uh, that are implementing the initiative, and we're a member of the Collaborative Conservation and Engagement Committee. So as a result, you know, we, we as participating in those uh, meetings, um, we're kept aware on of basically what's going on and have the opportunity to weigh in, you know, on a number of things. Um, Jordan mentioned in his, uh, what he just said, I alluded to the upcoming um, American Conservation and Stewardship Atlas. Um, that basically is going to be more or less the yardstick um, for measuring uh, measuring progress toward this goal of America, uh, the beautiful, which is preserving 30% of America's lands and waters by 2030. And this is the year that this atlas is going to be created. And it obviously, um, my understanding is it will be, you know, a, a GIS based, um, you know, um, digital um, uh, and totally um, um, the ability to will be constantly to continue to add to it as it evolves. And earlier this month, uh, in response to a request for information from the Department of Interior on the creation of the Atlas, uh, we did develop some comments based principally on what we heard in the December listening sessions, uh, worked with uh, the Vice Chairman and Reno Franklin to uh, develop these comments, which we then submitted to the group. Um, one of the key questions they had asked is, to the people to the, um, identify data sources, the Atlas. So we suggested that they should be looking at the Historic American Landscape Survey um, and at the National Register, as well as the inventories of federal agencies, tribes, states, and local communities, because of the amount of, of information, in some cases at least digital information, about historic properties that, do, um, that are associated with natural resources, because of course that is the, the key focus of this, but there, as we all know, there are many historic properties, cultural resources that either are natural resources or that have a great deal of natural resource components. So we suggested those um, key data sources to the group. Um, and then as um, the Vice Chairman said, this whole concept of what is conserved, what, what is considered conserved for this uh, initiative, they're still grappling with that actually. Um, I think it's safe to say that it will not mean permanent protection. Um, it will be something sh short of that. And if that's the case, we made the case in our comments that um, properties that are listed in are eligible for the National Register or properties on other, um, whether it's tribal, state, or local inventories that have a level of protection because listing on those inventories triggers some kind of environmental review, that those 
properties, if they indeed have natural resources associated with them, should be considered for inclusion in the atlas as conserved natural areas because of the level of protection that listing in inventories gives them. Um, that basically, I mean, we said a few other things, but uh, those kind of hit the two, um, some of the high points on that. And we're looking forward to our continued um, work at the staff, both at the staff and at the principal's level uh, with uh, America the Beautiful. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, hearing none. Oh, I see oh there is, one. I'm sorry, John, for, yes, yeah, John. <clears throat> is that a question per se, but more of a point I want to make, and I think this is probably the best place to do it. Yeah. If you don't me. First of all, I really feel like I'm at a disadvantage. I've been on this uh, part of this group now for almost two years and have not met a single person, <laughs> which is so <laughs> counter to every other organization I've been part of. I know hopefully this uh, whole COVID thing is going to wrap up soon that we can meet in, in uh, real life uh, next time. Um, I mentioned it before uh, at one of our last meetings. I just really want to flag this as an issue. Um, Preserve America communities. I know it's been suspended. I'm not really sure why, but we're still marketing it on our website pretty actively. Um, I would love to see it restored. Um, you know, our organization kind of goes under the screen for, for those who are not part of the preservation movement. Um, obviously, Section 106 is big, but uh, not everyone in the public understands what that's all about and how important it is. Um, however, Recognize the individual communities, um, I think, gives uh, our organization the opportunity to raise its awareness, number one, and also the importance of preservation. Now, this is going to sound a bit parochial. My own community, um, where I live here in Connecticut, is not one of the few towns uh, that had ever applied. They didn't know about the program, to be honest with you. Um, and we're, we're very historic. The only uh, conf uh, land conflict of the Revolutionary War took place in my community uh, in 1777. We're actually celebrating its anniversary at the end of April, and I invite you all to come up. Last year, a home outside of our historic district, which has stricter uh, restrictions, uh, they were digging their basement out, and they discovered four skeletal remains. Well, the first thing they did was to call the police. <laughs> and they said, now, these are really, really old. They called the state archaeologists. They exhumed these remains. They sent them to Yale. It's been uh, discovered that. John, I think you went on mute by accident. Okay, there we go, sorry. There you go. Um, it was discovered that these are four soldiers. Uh, they're not quite sure whether they're American, British, or Hessian, uh, but this home is immediately adjacent to, a, to the cemetery that was at the third and final conflict that took place in my town. Make a long story short, on May 1st, we're gonna be giving a military uh, burial service for these th uh, four uh, remains. But um, I just think it, it reinforces the importance that this program could serve in raising uh, historical preservation across our communities. And again, raise awareness of our organization. So I would really encourage us to somehow flag this in raises for consideration that we restore this program and allow people to uh, apply. John, what's the town again? What, what's, that, what's that town? Some folks have been asking. Uh, uh, sure, it's Ridgefield, Connecticut. Ridgefield. But I'm from, you know, in, throughout New England, I'm, I, you know, I have a house in Vermont, I'm familiar with Massachusetts, New York. There's so many towns that, um, uh, and I spoke to our state historic uh, officer, uh, so many towns, we're not, we're not aware of this program and it's, I wouldn't, not, wouldn't, I guess I wouldn't call it its demise because it's still on our website and it doesn't indicate that applications are not being accepted currently, although I guess that's the case. Um, there's so many communities that to me are obvious being up here in New England that um, are, not, are not recognized. So. Yeah, yeah. Would anyone from the staff like to comment, respond to John's questions about the status essentially of Pre Preserve America? I'd be happy to send something or I could defer to you, Reed, if you- No, you go ahead, Drew, yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, the Preserve America program, as you said, uh, John, is more or less, uh, the reason it hasn't disappeared from the website is it's more or less in a hiatus as opposed to being having ended. Um, the way the program was originally structured, it was very dependent upon participation by the White House. And that was both its strength and its weakness. On the one hand, it was a, obviously a great strength to have that direct connection. And as part of as in a large part being a recognition program that really appealed to a lot of people. But it also meant that with each change of administration, you sort of had to almost you know, re-argue for the program all over again and hope to get the White House buy-in so that you could keep it going. Um, so that, that was its biggest weakness. Um, we kind of, after the initial Bush administration where it was launched, um, we did get some traction with the Obama administration. <clears throat> we did not really get traction with the Trump administration and have not yet, um, obviously without uh, our chairman, in, in a, um, a confirmed chairman in place yet, have not reached out uh, to the Biden administration. So, but there are potentially some ways to decouple the program from that. But that's not a, that kind of White House involvement, like I said, is fantastic, but not really required for the program to move forward. Um, so when maybe when, once uh, Sarah's confirmed, Sarah Brennan is confirmed, we'll have an opportunity to revisit Preserve America and either say it is a remnant of the past and it will go away or see whether it could be reinvigorated um, uh, to you know, meet the current meet the current challenges and maybe focus on some of the issues that the administration is interested in, as well as being the kind of recognition program it was um, over the past number of administrations. And one okay. of the first communities we'd love to reach out to is Richfield. Yeah, it's indeed. Yeah, that, that'd that. be great. Yeah, and I, I would I hope it's I hope it's the latter, and um, I, I don't see why it couldn't be decoupled from the White House. You know, from, we're relying on the administration for so many things. You know, a, any administration for so many things. Um, but it seemed like this could be decoupled. Um, I served 22 years in our state legislature. In my last year, uh, two years ago, uh, I passed a bill allowing coastal districts in communities. I think we're like the seventh state to do that. And my town was the first one to do it. And we incorporated Many of the historic, we've got several historic museums and then we've got a museum on the streets, uh, which really allows our, our historic uh, aspects. Um, so we've been able to use that as a economic driver, bringing people to our community. So there's so many positives to this. Um, I think it could probably be a standalone outside of whether an administration actively supports it or not. But it, I, I, don't, I don't want to grandstand. I just want to flag it that it's important to me, probably to others. Um, and if we could, you know, give it consideration in the future, that'd be great. Yeah, John, thanks for bringing that up. I, I really appreciate that. I think that that, that was, um, you know, that, that, that's a good thing to not lose sight of, to not forget about that program. And hopefully we can resuscitate it uh, in, uh, in, in the administration will resuscitate it in the future and, um, and we can go forward with it. Okay, any other questions. Um, all right, then let's move on to legislation. And I want to thank Rick for a great discussion in his committee, uh, the, Pre the Preservation Initiatives Committee uh, yesterday, really, really terrific. And, and a number of bills were uh, talked about that are being currently under consideration in the Congress. And rather than my describing them, I'm going to call on Rick, who's much more familiar with them, to, uh, to share that with the committee, so with the group. Thank you, Jordan. And thank you, Drew, again, for all of your help. It was a great uh, meeting yesterday afternoon, and I think a great ending. So we'll talk about that at the end of our meeting today. Thank you, Jordan, for your support and read too. The PI committee uh, considered two pending bills and would like to offer motions regarding ACHP action Information on the bills, as usual, and the text on the motions were provided in the meeting book. And Drew will post the text of each, mo mo uh, each motion in the, in the chat as we continue. So Drew, if you could please upload motion number one, and then I'll read it. I can't hear you, okay. There yeah, you it's up there, it's in the chat now. Oh, okay, all right, so the motion states, um, that the ACHP supports the Historic Preservation Enhancement Act, HR 6589, and directs the chairman to advise the Congress of this support. Okay, then um, 
uh, can I, do I have someone who would like to make the motion? I'll make the motion. You'll make the motion. Okay, good. Thank you. Do I have a wall second? A second. Great. Okay. Thank you. And in this case, we do do a roll call vote, correct? Okay. Correct. All right. So, um, Shayla, if you would do take the roll. Okay. You are voting on the first motion. Uh, Mr. John Finley. Uh, yes, in favor. Mr. John Fry. I am at. Rick Gonzalez. Yes. Luke Nichter. Yes. Jay Vote. Aye. Reno Franklin. And uh, in, in my eye, I would also like to put on the record the importance of the fact that a Trump appointee and an Obama appointee just made this motion. <laughs> uh, the beauty of us all working together. <laughs> Aye. Duly noted. Duly noted. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Robert Simison. Uh, aye. Britt Blanton. Mr. Blanton? Um, Sandy Watts, USDA. Abstain. Caroline Henry, DOI. Abstain. Tom Chalecki, DHS. Tom had to step away. Okay. Dr. Pullman? Um, we'll be abstaining. Okay. Kevin Bush from HUD. Abstain. Colleen Vaughn from DOT. Abstain. Michael Brennan from VA. Abstain. Beth Savage from GSA. Abstain. Paul Edmondson from the National Trust. Aye. Ramona Bartos from Nick Shippo. Enthusiastically, yes. <laughs> You have Shasta your words back. <laughs> Shasta gone from NAFPO. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Shasta, I missed that. I. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and Vice Chairman Tannenbaum. Enthusiastically, really enthusiastically, I. <laughs> um, did. Uh, architect of the Capitol, Mr. Blanton, did he step back in? Maybe not. Okay. Um, Mr. Vice Chairman, the motion passes with 11 ayes. Great. Okay. Terrific. Terrific. Uh, um, do we have, yes, Rick? We have a second motion? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So uh, our second motion, uh, move that the ACHP supports the, here's a tough word for a Cuban, Semi quincentennial. There we go. <laughs> Very good. All right. Very good. Commemoration Coin Act. Um, and you'll get your coin, Mr. Chairman, for all your hard work. <laughs> and that is Senate Bill 2384, House uh, Bill 4429, recommends that the term related areas be defined in the bill and directs the chairman to so advise the Congress. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have someone who will make the motion? Motion. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a second? A second. John Fry. Okay. Great. Okay. And uh, the roll call, please. Okay. Second. Uh, excuse me. So, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Uh, if, if there's any discussion first, oh, uh, I'll be moving to any, the vote. Thanks. Sure. Any discussion? Thanks. Thanks, Javier. Okay. Hearing none. Um, Let's roll. Okay. Uh, John Finley. Uh, yes. John Fry. Yes. Rick Gonzalez. Yes. Luke Nichter. Yes. Jay Vote. Aye. Reno Franklin. Aye. Mayor Simison. Aye. Mr. Blanton, still not with us. Um, Sandy Watts. Abstain. Caroline Henry. Abstain. Tom Chalecki. 
Teresa Pullman, sorry. Oh, that's all right. I'm back. Oh, Tom's back. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Kevin Bush. Abstain. Colleen Vaughn. Abstain. Michael Brennan. Abstain. Beth Savage. Abstain. Paul Edmondson. Aye. Ramona Bartos. Aye. Shasta Gone. Aye. Vice Chairman Tannenbaum. Aye. Mr. Vice Chairman, that motion passes with 11 ayes. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Hill. Okay, uh, moving on, um, Mr. Act, Mr. Acting Chair Emeritus, <laughs> would you, do you have any other uh, items that you would like to share from the PI committee? That title sounds very nice, by the way. <laughs> 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 I'm done with this one. I'll wait for the next uh, item on your, on your um, agenda. <laughs> okay, okay. I think, um, uh, are there any, I don't see any other items. We're, we're about to go on to, I believe, um, oh, uh, okay. yeah, infrastructure, right? I think. Right. Oh, before that. Right, yes. there, there was one other thing we had talked about. Right, yeah, yeah. the yeah. Ukraine, Ukrainian situation. Yes, I'm sorry, it, it said B, other reports. So I was waiting for your, uh, okay. Oh, it's okay. Okay, it's okay, all right. Green light, green light, green light. <laughs> oh boy, so as we talked yesterday afternoon, I'm, I'm glad I spoke up. I'm not a quiet kind of guy. I, I learned from Reno, right, to, to talk <laughs> when you need to talk. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, it, it came to me all these years of practicing historic preservation over 35 years and luckily to be here for the last two years and how well everybody in this country tries to work for historic preservation. Um, the fact that I'm sure all of us or most of us have probably had a hard time sleeping at night as we see not only the death of so many innocent people, but the destruction of so much historical heritage uh, in Ukraine. And, and not only in Ukraine, but I was also thinking about in Syria, right? Uh, several years ago, so many beautiful places in Syria and, um, and seeing all of this right now in Ukraine. And, and I know that there are many, many good people doing many, many good things for the people of Ukraine, but uh, we need to do our part, you know? And I thought uh, if we could send a message, write a letter, do something to say that American historic preservation uh, groups, agencies that are involved with historic preservation, you know, stand firmly and ask for the immediate stop of wantless, reckless, stupid destruction of, of all the historic places of the, uh, I was born in a city that's a world heritage city, Havana. I'm giving a, a talk on Havana at, uh, at UNESCO in Spain later this summer. And I don't know what to say anymore, frankly, because Havana is in a situation because of political conditions and poverty. But what we've seen in the last month is, is just, there's, we're all speechless. So what can we say in the strongest matter, our little agency <laughs> that works with so many big agencies makes some sort of a point so that um, even though we know, thank God, we have ICOMOS, US ICOMOS, the Smithsonian Institution, you know, what else can we, the ACHP, the little engine that can do uh, to, to stop or help stop some of this craziness that we're watching nonstop every day, every morning, every night. And um, reminds me a little bit uh, when I first got involved and uh, was thrown into the leadership after our leader was changed, Reed, and thank God I had you to help me out, Andrew. <laughs> But the whole issue with the Indian uh, places in Arizona, right, when we were able to stop something that we thought was not going to happen. Now, um, so that's it. I'm just putting that out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to, and adding this to the agenda for today. Um, this is, I think, very important. And um, anything that we can say about this, uh, write about this, share about this, you know, uh, eventually enough pressure, you know, will get something to happen. 
Yeah. And, and in closing, um, you know, every day, you know, every day we, we either are part of or we are or we see bullying in our country, right? At the tiniest levels, you know, uh, just yesterday on a, on a small project in a, I'm a town architect for a small town in Florida, in West Palm Beach, uh, a lawyer client was bullying for an approval when her drawings were incorrect. And I was just thinking, she's like a little Putin, right? I mean, there are people, you know, <laughs> this level of bullying has got to stop and we can start with the little pieces and go from there. Uh, it would be great. So if the ACHP can do something or write something about this situation, I think that would be great. Yeah, yeah. thank you. I would like to express my support too for uh, for what Rick has, has um, suggested and for his comments. I'd like to depart just a, um, for a moment and talk about uh, what we're doing at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. We are, we do have a fund that we've set up. Uh, given what we do, uh, this includes providing um, stipends for scholars, Ukrainian scholars who are studying all over the world uh, uh, and to, to, to uh, keep them um, funded. Uh, and we, we have a lot of fellows at the museum who have gra graduated, who spent time with us, graduated from our programs and, and are, where we're in the Ukraine, we had staff in the Ukraine that we were able to pull out. Uh, there are uh, archives to translate, there are oral histories to take, there are a lot mm -hmm. of things that we are doing now, ramping up, really enhancing uh, what we have been doing, but given the situation, doing what we can as institution, um, you know, we have a saying at the Holocaust Museum, what you do matters. In fact, it is uh, the emblem on our ongoing billion dollar campaign. Uh, and we also talk a lot about not being a bystander. I think that's all that, Rick, you know, it encapsulates what Rick was saying uh, and urging us to do. Uh, I want to point out this, um, is uh, John Finley pointed out to all of us yesterday and sent out some information. The Smithsonian has issued a statement in, in terms of what they want to see doing. I would describe what is going on now as cultural genocide. Yep. I really would. It, it's also a term I would use for a lot of things that occurred to our um, to Native American tribes and uh, Hawaiians and Alaskan natives too. But I but I do I do think that this is a time for us to be counted and not to be bystanders. Uh, and I'd like let's discuss it as a for a moment as a uh, council and then um, and then see where we go from here. So comments thoughts Reno and then Ramona. Uh, I will defer to Ramona, who had her hand up first. Okay, great. Couldn't tell. Ramona, please. Good, good afternoon, everyone. And I, I apologize for my voice, which is recovering from the pollen cloud that has descended on the southern United States at this point. So I, I, I want to strongly echo Rick's wonderful sentiments about this. This has been something that my family's been monitoring on a personal level very closely. But also professionally, we have counterparts in Ukraine. We have counterparts in Syria who are mightily stymied by what we are all called to do because of these acts of aggression. And I hope that as the conflict comes to an end, hopefully shortly, that we will look to not only our federal professionals, but also state professionals who are willing to offer and lend any support that they might to our counterparts, who I know are just absolutely horrified by all of their life's work uh, being diminished so quickly and, and so needlessly. I'd like to see if we can think about that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ramona. Marino. Yeah, thanks, uh, Rick, for bringing that up. You know, this whole this whole issue with Ukraine is a complicated one for uh, for me specifically and my tribe specifically. In that, um, you know, we have um, a treaty with with Russia that uh, you know, Russia uh, comes out to uh, to our tribal lands. And um, and we shake hands and uh, kiss babies and uh, do the whole thing, you know. Um, and and we have for two hundred years um, taken that that they, they uh, every time they want to build uh, at our village of Matini where we allowed them to put Fort Ross, um, they actually will uh, go through the process with the state and then um, will will uh, defer to whatever the tribe says, yes or no. Uh, and so it's an interesting part of historic preservation that exists across international boundaries between the Indian tribe and, uh, um, and who is proving themselves to be a bully at the moment. And it's, it's, tough, to, it's tough to watch. It's really tough. I've got some lifelong friends and our tribes have uh, our tribes together of Russia and uh, 
in Kashaya. Through the Cold War, we sent uh, dance groups there. Uh, I grew up with ethnographers and spies coming to my great grandparents' house to talk about, uh, you know, Indian life ways. We had a number of uh, of our tribal members that were married to the uh, Russian fur traders and and, and went back uh, to Russia and. Uh, and so, you know, Kashaya has uh, spread our seed throughout Russia as well. And uh, every once in a while, some of those uh, folks get back in contact with us. This gets heartbreaking to see. Um, you know, um, I've been I've been public in in my opinions on that, but uh, also, you know, cautiously um, saying that because uh, because of how long um, that treaty and that relationship has lasted. Um, they've done horrible things in the past. They'll do horrible things in the future. I think the important thing to remember is that those things that are good should continue to be celebrated. And the relationship between my tribe and Russia must be celebrated in a good way, in a respectful way. But at the same time, it needs to be very clear that my tribe does not condone the behavior that they're doing right now. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's heartbreaking to see the people, any people suffer, and certainly a democratic nation suffering because of a dictator is, uh, is tough, tough to watch. I'm uh, in full support of making some kind of a statement that addresses the, uh, the history of an entire country, of an entire portion of, of a continent that is being destroyed. Um, and, uh, and I think intentionally in some places. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Rena. Thank you, John. John. Fender. Thank you. Uh, so if um, you know, two, two possibilities of things to do, one we've mentioned uh, some sort of statement deploring, I think then we have a statement of, you know, that we deplore what's going on in terms of uh, the cultural destruction. My only caution would be that we be very careful with our language in terms of um, what we know uh, as opposed to what we fear. Um, obviously, what we know is like buildings are being shelled all over the place. But um, if one, for example, uh, you're talking about cultural genocide, there needs to be intent shown that they are trying to do that. So clearly, that might be a byproduct, but I don't know that we really know that. And so I would have a caution in terms of being careful. It may be that you would also, before you make a statement, you would talk to people, whether it's at the Smithsonian or UNESCO or the people at the Holocaust. So I'd be kind of careful with the statement mm -hmm. and not mm -hmm. just be... A, uh, and, and an emotional statement, which obviously we're all feeling. The second thing is, what can we do? Um, one of the things that we don't really know is what's actually being destroyed. And what, uh, in other words, we know things are being destroyed, but do we know, for example, the St. Sophia Cathedral has been damaged? I don't know. Maybe people on the call know, but there, for example, there's seven UNESCO heritage sites. If for, for us to get some information as to what's actually been damaged and then be able to communicate that to opinion leaders and whatever, that might actually be useful to get people upset that a very specific example of like this beautiful mosaic destroyed, this beautiful uh, gold leaf uh, 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 tower destroyed. And that so that would be basically what I'm sort of saying is get as much information as possible to be able to both uh, have a statement that's very accurate and precise, as well as maybe be able to get out some information that get more people excited about uh, how uh, uh, horrible uh, what's going on as opposed to just broad brush. Great, thank you, thank you. Well, well said, John, well said. Um, Reed and then Rick and then Luke. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. I'll be brief and, and just, um, I agree with Mr. Finley that we would want to gather as much information as we could. And I will attest that um, should the members so direct us, I will work with staff to gather as much information about uh, clear and direct damages as we can. We've already reached out to some of our colleagues and other organizations and are already getting some information about World Heritage sites that have been damaged and things like that. And we would certainly um, touch bases with a number of you all as well. As was mentioned earlier, the Smithsonian has done some of this already. We would work with the Smithsonian, the Department of State, and others to gather as much information using the context that we have, our contacts in the Park Service at the World Heritage uh, Center as well, and um, make sure that we could quantify this to the extent that we could. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Yeah, just quickly, too. I, I forgot to mention that yesterday, we, we talked about uh, the power of Google Maps, you know, how you can go on Google Maps 
and look, which is what I did. I looked at it a, a week or so ago and I went to all of these towns and I clicked on it. And you know what? They never show a picture of a big, ugly, modern building, right? It's always like a whole bunch of beautiful little, it's always historic, right? Everybody's smiling. I like that. Good. And then maybe that big, ugly building is all the way in the bottom, right? If you scroll all the way to the bottom, right? So when you, you know, and maybe staff can do some of this read, they can go to the cities, they can look at what was there from February back, and they can compare to all the images that we're seeing online of all of this heavy destruction. And to John, I would say some cities, especially in the eastern part of the country, are over 80% destroyed. If that's not cultural genocide and human genocide and everything else under the word genocide, I, I don't know what else is. You know, as an architect planner, I don't, you know, you, you knock out 10% of a city, okay, you know, 30% maybe, you know, but 80%, that, that's already proof that in some locations, there's been total destruction. So maybe Reed staff can, can do some of that and, and use the power of Google Maps to, to help us in this research. Yeah, I'm be, I, uh, just to make sure that you don't think I'm overly insensitive. Um, I, I, it's not so much that I don't feel the culture is being destroyed, but uh, the term cultural genocide is a very specific intent crime. So that you, if you have artillery shelling that you're trying to destroy civilians, if the byproduct is cultural, it may not be cultural genocide per se, because you didn't have the intent. You just were intending to kill people and the buildings were in the way or create civilian damage. But we're kind of um, parsing words or quibbling. It doesn't really matter. There's cultural destruction. We all agree with that. Whether it's technically the war crime of cultural genocide is sort of a separate issue. But the point is it's cultural destruction at a scale that we're all horrified by. Um, so I, I apologize for being a lawyer about it. <laughs> no, no, no apologies, please. <laughs> okay, uh, Luke. Right, thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman. I'll be brief also uh, to the points already made. Um, I just wanna add um, kind of like our own history, the history of that region is complicated. Uh, so I think it's another reason to, to be careful about the language in our statement. You know, a, a number of uh, history and um, history related organizations have recently teamed up together on a statement. And so I will, um, uh, I will post a link to the American Historical Association in the chat uh, to, to that links to their statement and all of the organizations that have signed on to that statement. And perhaps that might help as a guide or, or a model that we might use, that's all. Great, great, thanks. Um, let's see, uh, Robert. Uh, just really from, from a slightly different perspective, but as a newer city, history is created every day. And, and what, what was once there today is the history that's going to be important 100 or 200 or 300 years, we don't know. So to a certain extent, I think it all has value when you look at it, because um, you never know what is going to be the uh, masterpiece that people are going to look back on 100 years in the later um, from that one architect who was a, a brilliant individual. So just, I think it all has value and matters. That's all. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Shasta and then Kak. Well, first I want to do a, a, be a, a brief uh, professor of anthropology in terms of the, the terms genocide um, and cultural genocide that the way we teach it in my field is that the physical, literal destruction of a people is genocide. The destruction of a people's culture is ethnocide. And uh, I think that's, it's a reasonable to make that distinction. And maybe that language is a little bit less fraught for people than the word genocide. But I also want to say, um, you know, as somebody who represents a tribe and, and many tribes through NAFPO, uh, that um, we've struggled, you know, for, for centuries now um, as, as those who work for tribes or as tribal people themselves to have it even recognized in this country that what happened to Native American people was both genocide and ethnocide. So I, I, uh, I understand the, the hesitation and the reluctance uh, because words are important, but I do think that it's, it's worth being strong in our language uh, when we talk about what is happening um, to, our, um, to our friends in Ukraine. Great, thank you, thank you. CAC. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I have a couple of suggestions for the staff as they continue to follow on this thread. And that is, as we've talked some about World Heritage Sites, um, 
obviously the International Council on Monuments and Sites and UNESCO will have a strong presence and position on that. And I think that <clears throat> you could follow up with the US um, Consulate, US Council on International Council on Monuments and Sites, US ECOMOS. They'll be in connection in co contact with all of those folks at this point. There's also another organization that has arisen that um, will be part of that mix, and that's called the Blue Shield. And so if you reached out to US ECOMOS, you probably would find out what, what's current. I don't know. But um, the, the last of that is that um, what you see after disasters like this, and there will be an after, is the need for professionals and sometimes um, just workers to come in and help restore. And <clears throat> excuse me. If you look at a number of places that are considered World Heritage Sites today, um, certainly the, the center of Warsaw, um, the castle that the president spoke from was a destroyed site in Warsaw that is now a World Heritage Site. The center of Dresden was destroyed in World War II, and it's now a World Heritage Site, not as a destroyed site, but as a restored site. And so I think that's the thing to think about as well. It's not just right now. It what is ha what will happen in 10 years from now? What will it be like? And what will they need to restore their, their society as they restore their buildings? Great, thank you, Kak. Any other comments? Um, so where do we go from here? Um, Javier, I'm going to turn to you to use the good legal phrase. This is a matter of first impression, at least for this acting chair, in terms of where we go. Can we request that, that um, do we need to take a vote or can we just request that the staff prepare some comments that they would circulate to the members and then send an appropriate, send to the appropriate place? Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with everything that Mr. Finley said. I mean, maybe it's the same Miller training, but but yeah. but I agree with what he says. We we need to take this as a staff and take a look at it carefully. Also, maybe talk to the to the Department of State. So I would say kick it to the to the staff so we can create a a draft that you can all take a look at. Great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Vice much. Chairman. We, we have already reached out to a number of those organizations are already talking with U.S. ICOMOS and others getting information in now. Um, and as I indicated earlier, I would want to um, sort of compare notes with other organizations. Those that Luke mentioned, um, the Smithsonian, as I mentioned earlier, and absolutely touch bases with the Department of State. Um, I think we could produce a statement of concern that we could then you know, once you anoint, share with all of the members for comment before issuing. Yeah, great, good. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Rick, did you have another? Just wanna make sure that um, this doesn't go on the wayside for, for weeks and weeks. Hopefully we're talking days and days. Yeah. Okay, yes. thank you. Okay, great. Um, any other comments from the group? I see a couple more hands up. Okay, all right, let's move on. Um, thank you again, Rick for bringing that to our attention and for raising that very, very important. Um, Jay, I wanna thank you for a great, an, another great committee meeting, great federal agency programs meet, uh, committee meeting. And um, would you and Blythe, who is uh, also your partner in that, a report on the status of our efforts to address issues related to the bipartisan infrastructure bill and section 106. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd be glad to, and I'm going to call on Blythe later on to add anything that I have missed. Um, the Federal Agency Programs Committee discussed the Advisory Council's ongoing efforts to respond to Section 106 capacity concerns raised by a potential wave of new infrastructure projects. And we all know that the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act is going to require a lot of federal expenditures to do some of that work. Members noted that some federal agencies, um, particularly Federal Highway Administration, have used their specific authorities to supplement the staff capacity at the State Historic Preservation Offices, and these partnerships have been very successful in the past. Um, the Advisory Council issued guidance on assistance to consulting parties in the Section 106 review process in 2018, um, but it may not be well known among um, agency decision makers and the staff will consider 
how to raise awareness about this guidance. Um, we already have it there. Hopefully it will be put to better use um, with our federal um, agency partners. However, a related concern is how to find qualified professionals for preservation positions, even if agencies or others can fund them. I mean, you know, so we get the money, but nobody qualified to do it. And, and members recommended that the advisory council give attention to recruitment and identify, identifying qualified professionals. Uh, members discussed how temporary or intern positions could help attract new professionals to preservation careers. Um, they noted apprenticeship approaches could transfer skills in a way that academic coursework does not. Um, they also talked about the need for exposure to preservation and opportunities like the Preservation in Practice Program for architectural students at um, historically black colleges and universities, or the Forest Service's new um, Cultural Heritage in the Forest Summer Program, which acquaints university students with cultural resources and preservation careers. Um, remote work options um, could also broaden the pool of applicants for some positions. I mean, if the capacity to have people work, not at the work spot, but someplace else, may be able to attract people into the positions. And the larger issue of ensuring a knowledgeable and qualified workforce is available to support federal preservation is one of the advisory council can examine further. Um, perhaps by collaborating with other federal agencies to promote work in federal preservation through academic programs or by discussing recruitment challenges with the Office of Management and Budget. Um, so I'm gonna turn to Assistant Director Blythe Semmer and ask her for any follow-up and additional information. Sure, thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. And I think that uh, that has covered our discussion, but we're happy to answer any questions um, the members may have about that, and we will follow up. Um, Mr. Chairman, or Mr. Vice Chairman, um, this is our report on the infrastructure, and we're available for questions. Great, thank you. Thank you much, Shay. So um, moving on, um, let me acknowledge, um, as we all learned, uh, uh, in your committee's report that the bipartisan infrastructure bill includes a significant investment in electric vehicle charging stations to serve the federal fleet and the importance of, of working with agencies on finding effective ways for them to meet their 106 responsibilities uh, when you get, you know, regarding the construction of those, um, of those charging stations. Um, so um, this is something that you and Jamie Luckinger uh, uh, talked about a great deal and educated us on. And could you summarize the committee's discussions on this particular matter uh, and um, also touch on the issue of the whole issue of an exemption, uh, I think would be would be helpful too, because it's, it's done so rarely. And you know, so many people haven't ever had that exposure to it, but I think it, it is something that is has arisen as a result of this particular case. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. The Federal Agency Programs Committee heard about an emerging effort to develop an exempt category for electric vehicle charging stations, a program alternative that was last issued by the Advisory Council in 2005. And I think there's only, this is only the, um, they only had two previously, as, as, as I understand. The committee heard about how exemptions are used in a Section 106 process efficiency and what criteria apply to their development. I'm going to ask um, Jamie Leuschinger to Assistant Director Jamie Leuschinger to provide a deep, brief description of the current effort and the Advisory Council's role. Jamie. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, with the there was a good conversation in Monday's committee meeting, but uh, and the meeting book paper that was included does do a pretty good job of outlining what an exemption is, what the requirements are, and and how they're developed. The current effort that's that's being led by the ACHP with uh, lots of assistance from DHS, who initially started the conversation, GSA, Veterans Affairs, DoD, Army Corps, a lot of assistance also from DOT. Um, we're basically starting a small working group to start drafting out an exemption. As you noted, one hasn't been done for many years. So we're 
we're kind of taking a look at it as a smaller working group to make sure that what's included in it sufficiently covers what we think would reasonably be charging stations that would result in no effect or no adverse effect to historic properties if they were to be there. Uh, again, the focus is primarily on charging stations that are for passenger vehicles, not for buses or larger fleets and um, doesn't would really rely on existing facilities, you know, building, adding it into places that already have kind of the existing infrastructure for it. Um, right now, because the ACHP is going to use its authority to propose it on its own, um, we'll be fleshing out what a consultation strategy looks like. We're hoping to kind of lead the way about what it would look like for an exemption for other agencies if they wanted to use this alternative going forward, what would a reasonable and good faith effort look like as far as consulting with SHPOs, tribes, TIPOs, um, other consulting parties, Native Hawaiian organizations, and particularly the public side of it. So um, we'll be drafting out that consultation strategy in the next few weeks and, and hopefully getting this underway shortly. Great, great. Thank you, Jamie. Um, as, we, as she pointed out, we're, we're looking at an exemption that would be used by many federal agencies, not just geared for one. And we've also heard from several of the federal agencies working on this effort, including DHS, GSA, um, Veterans Administration, and DOT. They highlighted the, the, the reversibility uh, and temporary nature of electric vehicle charging facilities as something that makes it them suited for an exemption category given the rapid evolution of the technology. We fully expect lots of changes um, in this whole field over the next few years. Members highlighted the need to involve and inform the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions and local governments who may also have a particular interest in these facilities if they are also subject to local reviews. We also considered whether this exemption would line up with NEPA, um, categorical exclusions, which we acknowledged um, would depend on agency-specific NEPA procedures, a question that can be clarified through our consultation efforts. The committee also recommended that the Advisory Council write additional guidance on the development of exemptions. First, however, the staff will lay out a plan to inform members about development of this particular exemption. Staff is um, committed to keeping the Federal Agency Programs Committee and membership informed about the development of electric vehicle charging stations exemption. And I look forward to keeping the council members updated on this effort. Um, um, that's the remaining part of this report, um, Mr. Vice Chairman. And if you have any questions, the members have any questions, um, Jamie and I will be glad to try to answer them. Great, okay, any questions for Jay or Jamie? Okay, hearing none, thank you. Thank you again, terrific, terrific report. Um, okay, moving on to Native American Affairs, let me call on- well, 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 Mr. Vice Chairman, I have a couple other reports. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry, I'm sorry, I, go ahead, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, there are two other updates I want to mention um, from this meeting, uh, from our meeting on Monday. First, the committee heard a brief presentation from the Army Federal Preservation Officer about the Army's efforts to develop a, a program comment for Vietnam War era housing. Um, the Army is basing this approach on existing programmatic program comments for Cape for Heart Weary and interwar era housing. Um, a series of consultation meetings with stakeholders is currently underway, and the Army hopes to submit a formal request for a program comment. Um, by August. The committee also heard from members, including Nick Shippo and the National Trust, who oppose including the inclusion of demolition in this development proposal. Um, council members' input and engagement on such issues is very important. Um, as the chair of the program comments review panel that examined the development process recently, and as committee chairman, I've asked the staff to bring these and other concerns with substantial com um, of, with the substantive content um, of the program comment proposal back to the membership for additional discussion as the development process proceeds. And it's also important as council members that we are keeping track of what um, programmatic alternatives are out there and particularly the program comments. 
Um, and then second, the Department of Veterans Affairs brought to the committee's attention the release of a recent report evaluating the VA's healthcare infrastructure. The assessed, the, the asset <clears throat> and infrastructure review or AIR report um, was made available to the public on March 14th. I understand that Michael, Dr. Michael Brennan of the VA would like to update members on the report and its relevance to the advisory council's work. So I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brennan. Sure. Um, without going into a, too much detail, I think it's important to, uh, to let the membership know um, what's really just um, starting out here. So uh, on March 14th, the VA released um, the uh, asset uh, infrastructure um, review to the public record. And to back up and what that is, is uh, there's a legislated look at the the Mission Act to look at the VA and 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 assess um, care, benefit, and services. Are they aligned correctly? After every major conflict, we've built new facilities where the where the veterans lived, and those demographics have changed over time. So there is a linkage to um, historic uh, VA facilities going back over the whole course of the VA. Now. Over the past uh, couple of years, there's been market area studies that have been looking at uh, the services and benefits provided in those legacy facilities across the entirety of the VA in relationship to what the demand is from the veteran populations and what the trends are for the next 20 years. And the result of all that work was a list of recommendations which are now in the public record. Um, we can certainly provide a link to the committee um, to, to, to access those. But this is really the start. Um, the nominations for most of uh, the Air Commission um, nominations has been released pending confirmation. Um, so that is incomplete. When that body is fully formed, next year they will um, be required to report to the president and ultimately to Congress on, on, on the recommendations um, beyond the department. There's a whole host of uh, potential recommendations and opportunities that were made. Um, everything from grow in place, resize, um, pull out some of the services and relocate them locally um, to be more community-centered care, um, all the way to the recommendations of to replace an entire uh, medical center at a new site or new location. So there's a whole whole gamut of, of potential op options that are being considered um, that will ultimately be made in formal recommendations. I think one thing to be very clear is, is in the execution of this, we're looking at years, decades um, across the entire department and the rollout. Um, there won't be an attempt to eat the elephant in one bite, um, just practically speaking because of the, the sheer size. So as it, things move forward through this year, we'll have a better idea of what the, 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 the give and take and political no, negotiations of, of, of what the recommendations may make it past all these hurdles to be implemented. And then there'll be a, a strategic plan to implement those. One, one, I want to use a term here and I'm hesitating on it because it's, it's clearly not, um, the right term and in the VA we consciously don't like the BRAC word because it's two different things entirely. But I think there are correlators in the scale of what they um, are looking to achieve and shape in the department. You know, the difference in BRAC was looking to 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 find efficiencies or consolidation and and closures of excess space. That's not the 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 mission of air. In air it's about aligning the benefits and services to where the veterans are ultimately. And certainly there will be some efficiencies that will be um, um, brought along the way in this process. You know, there's, there's many challenges, even if we have facilities that are services and care that will be recommended remain in the same market area in places where we have facilities that are, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years old, it becomes a challenge to provide cutting edge, bleeding edge um, um, healthcare. And so we have to look at all our options of how we, we, we have physical infrastructure solutions to meet the 
the services not just now, but where the trends are going in the future. And generally the trends are moving south and southwest. A lot of our legacy uh, facilities are northeast um, and the veteran population has just moved. So this is, this, is, this is a big deal. And I think there will certainly be um, um, consideration and impact for, for many historic um, campuses and facilities out there and, and finding out what the best way to approach that is. Probably a little premature right now um, on what those decisions will be. There has, if you've been following the media and maybe in your location, there's been a lot of um, polar opposites of either happiness at what some of the recommendations are because they would bring services to where um, veterans are served now or a reaction or opposition to something that may move out of an area because the veteran population is no longer um, there. The team, the team has been talking about there, there were some, uh, some assistance was given to the, the BRAC process in, in, in regards to uh, historic preservation. And I think we need to look at that as a, a, a body as this matures and we get more clarity over this coming year and see the direction of where things are going and what the scale and scope would be. But I think the two key takeaways are is there's something that, that is going to happen because it needs to. You know, the average age of modern healthcare facilities um, in industry is 16, one six years old. We are on the far, far end of the 50s in, in the VA. And it do, old does not mean obsolete, but it's becoming more and more challenging to, to pile in the infrastructure and the IT backbones into these old frames to be able to continue to be not just um, current with modern, but the VA has a history of pushing um, innovation and advancement of, of, of healthcare on a national and international basis. So we, we will certainly want the help of this body and in whatever way we can to navigate what will be, I expect, a contentious um, for lots of reasons, not necessarily for historic preservation, but for other political reasons um, um, as we move forward into implementation in the coming years and decades. And I'll, I'll pause there if anybody has any questions. I'm gonna say thank you very much for your, for your information and just for the council's knowledge, information is that we just learned about this on um, Monday. So this is brand new to us too. Um, and so we have a lot of work left ahead for us. So, um, but thank you very much. Yeah, and, and, and Jay, I'd, I'd note that uh, Hector was kind enough. He, he put the link into the comments to the, uh, the report. So for those that are interested, um, that link will take you to the, the secretary's recommendations, but that's just the start of the work. As I said before, the Air Commission will stand up much like the BRAC Commission, and there will be a, a whole lot of engagement that goes on over the next year. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Vice Chairman, unless there's any questions, that concludes um, the Federal Agency Programs Committee report. And I just wanna thank um, Reed Nelson and Assistant Directors, Blythe Semmer and Jamie Leuschinger for all their assistance, as well as the entire staff of the OFAP office. Um, they do a remarkable amount of work and, and do it very well. But thank you very much for all of that. Thank you. Thank you, Jay, and thank you, Dr. Brennan. Uh, are there any, any questions on any comment? Uh, Reed, your hands up. Yeah, Jay, thank you for those kind words. And I would just say to Dr. Brennan, um, thank you for that update. Uh, we enjoy a very strong partnership with the Department of Veterans Affairs, and I look forward to using that partnership and this forum and other places to, to work with you on that. So thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments? If not, uh, then now we'll roll into the Native American Affairs uh, section. And um, Reno, thank you for a, a, a terrific meeting and Ira as well for your report on um, the ACHP's interaction with the White House Council on Native American Affairs. Um, if you can flesh out some of, of what went on there, Ira, that would be uh, most appreciated. Uh, Lemons, Mr. Chairman, uh, Reno, did you wanna open it up or you want me to jump into it? Yeah, I think I'll just, uh, just a couple of brief things before, uh, as we swing into this. Um, can we just stop for a second and acknowledge the quilt heaven that exists behind Jay? 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm just I'm sitting here checking them out, you know, kind of because I'm I'm uh, I'm having the quilt made for uh, for my daughters, uh, you know, what dads do. And so I start quilt. So I was checking out your setup there, Jay. I appreciate it, man. Just want to acknowledge you and acknowledge <clears throat> the hardworking individuals that made that background for all of us to enjoy. <laughs> well, well, thank you. My my wife is quite the quilter, and our little office area sits at the end of her quilting studio. And so I kick her out whenever we have these meetings. And so um, I will let her know that you appreciate her good work. Yeah, <laughs> please please do, and it's on the record. And I doubt you kick her out. She probably we graciously allows you some space. <laughs> <laughs> so um you know and and jordan uh mr chairman mr vice chairman thank you so much uh you know we we have been active the achp you know um, through ona has uh, has been very active with uh, the white house council of native american affairs uh and and it's great to support some good work that they're trying to get done so uh in the interest of time i'm going to throw this over to uh ira and, and let him kind of summarize that uh for you for us thank you uh, I'm Mr. Franklin. So uh, I know we're going to talk about two of them today, uh, two of our efforts, and really owners, we're working in a lot of committees and subcommittees. And one of the reasons that we like to be involved with the White House Council is it provides us that opportunity to really elevate the voice of cultural resources uh, and make sure they're being considered at all levels of government. And I think as everybody here knows, that's it's not an you know, easy thing to do. There's there's a lot of other considerations out there. So we try to make sure that people hear us. And, um, you know, we're here to talk about climate change today. It'll be our first topic and just a bit of background on it. So everybody knows, um, you know, the ACHP, we have a an action plan specific to tribal and native Hawaiians. And this started actually in 2020 um, and developed through 2021 along with ACHP's other offices. But it really began regarding the intersection of emergency response and disasters with uh, places important to Indian tribes and Native Hawaiians. And the goal at that time was to just address a lot of the longstanding issues that already existed. But subsequent to that effort, uh, Biden issued his executive order on the climate crisis. Uh, the ACHP initiated their task force and developed its broader uh, climate adaptation plan. And the White House Council developed its Climate Adaptation Subcommittee. Um, so as a result of all of that, that Tribal and Native Hawaiian Action Plan really grew uh, to address climate change, but it also started to make space to coordinate with the task force and with the Climate Adaptation Subcommittee. And so up to this point, um, you know, the efforts with the subcommittee have been pretty good. One of the first things that we worked to do through them and this wasn't just at the ACHP level, this is a cross government, was to incorpor incorporate consideration of tribal treaty and reserved rights into these plans. Uh, alongside that, we incorporated the consideration of traditional knowledge. And so while that first step might've been small, incorporating that language allows us to create a space for these to be considered. And it was something that we heard a lot in our listening sessions. I know Reno touched on it earlier, uh, but those are big considerations for Indian tribes um, and Native Hawaiians as well. So we wanted to make sure as a first step that we had those considerations. Um, secondly, the subcommittee has really worked to develop an inventory of agency climate adaptations, the plans and the strategies. Uh, and the goal here is to find ways to help standardize the implementation efforts and the terminology, um, similar to what you just heard with with uh, uh, traditional knowledge. And the key here is that the White House Council with their all of government approach believes that agencies can't continue to independently develop plans, processes and definitions without seeking some sort of commonality in there. And regarding cultural resources, uh, the development of shared language is gonna be the next step in helping to assure that federal planning uh, accounts for these resources. Uh, and really our next steps with our plan in relation to the task force and the subcommittee is just to figure out what specifically in this plan each of those groups wants to be able to support so that we can make sure that we're maximizing everybody's time and resources in an effort to help Indian tribes and Native Hawaiians. Um, so that's just a brief rundown on how we've been working with them and I'll turn it back over to Reno to open us up um, on some of what we're doing with sacred sites in the White House Council. 
Yeah, thanks, Ira. So, you know, as you all know, um, sacred sites and ACHP are best friends and uh, <laughs> have hung out and had lunch together at every recess since school started. And uh, so as one of the um, highlighted areas where we've engaged with, uh, with tribes and agencies on sacred site protection is, uh, is the MOU, the sacred sites MOU. So, you know, the ACHP, we have been signatories um, 2012, 2016, and on uh, the 2021 Sacred Sites MOU. Um, you know, uh, this year uh, for 2021, um, uh, personally I'm happy and, and, and as our Hawaiian people that Native Hawaiians were included in the MOU. Um, something that I just, I don't know how it didn't happen before, but, uh, but it didn't. And so um, the, uh, the White House Council of Native American Affairs uh, you know, has taken leadership of the work group as well, and is uh, and is, it's a good step to making sure that the right people are there at the table uh, and um, finding better ways to implement that MOU. Um, we had uh, the the opportunity to participate in the uh, White House Council of Native American Affairs uh, Sacred Sites Listening Session. Uh, that was great. It was a really good listening session. Again, it was the one that was packed with uh, tribes and uh, Native Hawaiian leaders. Uh, and, um, you know, to be able to participate in those kind of conversations along with our federal uh, agency partners was, uh, was, was both meaningful to agencies, uh, meaningful to the administration, and I think meaningful to the Native Hawaiian organizations and tribes that participated as well. Um, you know, we got different feedback, uh, whoops, we got different feedback from, uh, from that meeting. Um, and uh, again, I went over some of the stuff earlier, but uh, we just, you know, again, you know, a lot, a lot of work uh, requested on the front end, you know, to proactively identify sites and then secure that information uh, to have it useful um, uh, in the event that emergency events are taking place. Um, you know, agencies needing to budget for the efforts, um, consult earlier, commit to uh, protecting uh, the access to and the use of sacred places. Um, you know, it, we hear this in every form and not just this one. Uh, lots of concerns around uh, traditional knowledge, and how agencies are going to uh, find better mechanisms to ensure uh, the confidentiality of that knowledge, um, you know, uh, and to protect it, protect it from release under FOIA. And so again, you know, I touched on a few of these earlier, um, but you know, tribes or Native Hawaiians are, are really expressing their their fear that uh, this information is going to get out, uh, and uh, and it won't be good, you know, for them. To the detriment of the tribes and Native Hawaiian organizations. Um, so, and then we did hear, uh, you know, discussions or, or talk from uh, feedback asking for better training for uh, um, some federal staff so they can understand how to implement that MOU. So, uh, there's uh, hoping for better interagency coordination and uh, to ensure um, that uh, federal staff understand uh, how to properly interact with tribes and Native Hawaiian leadership. And, uh, and, and I think I would just also say that I think, I think you know, the agencies that are here on the phone with us, on the phone, here on this webinar thing with us, um, y'all are doing a good job, you know. And, and I, I, I hope sometimes when I see those comments get raised again and again, um, I don't want it to, like, be defeating, you know, because you, you all, especially the FPOs, you guys do a good job of, uh, of, of getting that information out there. But you know, at the same time, it's like, but there's, there's always going to be gaps. There's always going to be places where it doesn't happen. So best practices for, for you know, federal agency consultation. That is, that's, that, that's what gets us and moves us forward. Um, Gordon, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Okay. Any questions for, um, for Reno or Ira on this part of their presentation? If not, I'm going to turn it back to you, Reno and Ira, for talking a bit about our MOU and updating our MOU with the Salish Kootenai College, the only tribal college with a historic preservation program. Uh, if you can share that with us, absolutely. This this is the exciting stuff. You know, I just I just I just absolutely love that this exists and that we have a place to talk about you know successes. I just got done saying that highlighting the things that work right. You know. And, a best practice. This is a, this is the definition of a best practice. What we've done here, you know, the uh, Salish Kootenai College uh, MOU that that we have. Uh, you know, it's it's an initiative that uh, ONA has been implementing for some time, uh, and uh, 
the, uh, the, the college, it's a tribal college located on the Flathead Indian Reservation in Western Montana uh, and uh, home to the uh, Confederated Salish and uh, Kootenai tribes. And uh, uh, what we have is this, uh, an opportunity that, that you know, we seized to, to work with the college on their TIPO program. Um, I, would, I would also note that for the first time in history, the, uh, the, um, the appointee, American Indian and Alaska Native, uh, Native Hawaiian appointee to the ACHP to represent those communities, uh, and the director of ONA are both TIPOs. And, uh, you know, so um, having uh, Ira as a former TIPO and his understanding to myself as a current TIPO on top of the 10 million other hats that I wear, um, bring a different perspective on historic preservation from uh, the tribal side and how we work on it. And, and that should not be uh, overlooked, the fact that you have two TIPOs leading this way. Uh, so, so thanks, Ira, I want to recognize you for that. Um, yeah, we, we signed a three-year MOU with, uh, with the college uh, and, uh, and, you know, the, and the ACHP Foundation. Um, and we're at the point now to where it's 2021 and, and, and it's time to kind of look at that uh, MOU and see what, what we can do next. It's been so successful, so successful. Like we have something to build off of. And I think that that's probably one of the most exciting things about that. Um, Ira, do you want to talk a little bit about this? Yes, uh, thanks, Reno. Uh, I think Reno's right. You know, this has been a great initiative. It's been really fun. And it's not just because I went to that college at one time and it was right across the street from where I worked. Um, and despite the hurdles in the last few years, right? We've had government shutdowns, we've had the pandemic. This partnership has really endured. And I think in a large part, it's because that MOU has really helped keep the signatories, both the federal side and the college, invested and focused. Um, and, you know, the successful strides is something that they're in the meeting book. But we've been able to do these both in person and virtually, which has required a bit of shifting on both sides here. Uh, so I do want to just share a few of these for everybody's awareness and kind of going back to when we, we actually traveled. A lot of our in-person stuff was really great. We went to field schools with the college and it's interesting to see the students pick up projects that I had done 15 years earlier, uh, recording culturally modified trees and glacier. And that's what Reno's talking about our experience. We're able to really connect uh, directly with the students. We had a lot of in-person discussions in our classes. Um, and we also had a lot of uh, larger discussions that included the leadership. Uh, at that time, former chairman Giorgiani, we had Mr. Tannenbaum there, uh, Cax Slick. We all met in the theater and had these long conversations with the students. And to kind of tie this back to Wani Williams, former intern, current employee, that is the first time that she got to experience uh, the advisory council. So we're starting to see how this is uh, kind of builds and it's had a lot of positive influence. And it's not just a one-way street. Uh, the college has come to DC. They went out uh, and worked with Mr. Tannenbaum and provided a presentation at the Holocaust Museum. They've also been to the advisory council, talked to our staff and they've done interviews with OCEO. So it's really been a kind of a cross educational experience and virtually, uh, you know, Awani, going back to that, she was our first ever virtual intern uh, through the college, which has been a great experience. And we had a workshop last year where we got to partner with the National Park Service. We brought the students together in TIPOs from Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming, and just had an entire day of conversation and training. So it's really been robust. And it's been effective without throwing, really, to be honest, a lot of money at it. It's been motivated by partnership and need. So we heard some great committee feedback on this. Um, and really, I think NAFPO, they wanted to formally participate. And you don't have to sign this to formally participate. But going back to what I said earlier, that transparency to the college means a lot. Everybody wants to talk about a tribal college and kind of work with them but that commitment is really helpful for them. Uh, the committee members, they also had a, a great insight that it's not about just capacity building for students, but the college itself. Tribal colleges have a lot of challenges out there, uh, locations and funding, and they talked about our ability to potentially build some capacity at the college level. 
Chairman Tannenbaum, you reflected on some mentoring you provided a student. And I think, you know, that talked about their career and their life. And that's bringing back a focus towards pursuit of a mentorship. And that tied in with something that Cax Slick has said more than once. I'm going to admit that right off that we need to incorporate the ACHP's members, both past and present, in ways that their expertise can really benefit the students. We're talking uh, classroom discussions, mentors, or other arenas that you guys might see you can provide. Um, so really, our next steps is we're waiting for the college to get back. Um, the president and the vice president are, are figuring out a time to have a meeting, and we're going to continue to update this. So I'll turn it back to Reno, but if you guys have any feedback or thoughts on this, we, we always welcome. Any comments, questions? Volunteering to mentor? <laughs> All right, we got you down, Reed, got you down. Okay, and then Reno, any, any last comments or should we move on to the well, next? I think we can probably, you know, uh, move on and just, uh, we'll be reporting back on this MOU. So, you know, <laughs> the only time that you'll hear about it, but kind of planting the seed you know, uh, to all of you and, and think about, especially our agency folks, you know, that, um, you know, I know we lean heavily on you all as well and, and these kind of things. And uh, let's, let's find uh, pathways and more opportunities to support the college and support this program uh, and, and, and how we can build that into the MOU. So, great. Yeah. Great. Well, mo moving along in this very, very interesting presentation, I, I want to acknowledge the, the council's long time involvement with interagency efforts to um, to develop training and, and uh, uh, education for federal officials on the, the whole area of this government to government relationship that, the, that we have with the tribes uh, and Alaska Native governments. And um, could you bring us up to date on this one too, on some, some recent efforts to update the training perhaps? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, the, the, the quick update is that uh, the working effectively with American Indian and Alaska Native Tribal Communities training has been completed and it is live. So a uh, little bit of history there, the course is uh, initially, it was uh, launched in 2008, uh, updated in 2017, uh, but it's been offline for a little while. So it's back up live, Bill, wonderful job, my friend. I'm Bill Dancing Feather, getting that done for all of us uh, and, and really sticking to it, it's good work. So uh, the course, uh, you know, it's designed to help uh, uh, federal employees develop an understanding and awareness of tribal issues and the unique status of American Indian tribes and uh, our historic relationship with, uh, with the federal government, federal responsibilities to Indian tribes. Uh, the course presents important concepts such as uh, tribal treaties, federal recognition, tribal sovereignty, and the trust, federal trust responsibility. While it's focused on federal responsibilities, it's available to the general public and is free of charge so over the years, the training has been taken by thousands of people. So it, uh, it has the potential to be a, a, a big influence, a big help. Uh, and, uh, you know, and again, it, the, the fact that it's live uh, it, it is awesome. Um, during our, our committee meeting yesterday, uh, Carolyn Henry from uh, the FPO for the Department of Interior um, shared this with her agency contacts for distribution. And we hope that all of you will do the same. Uh, we have the link, it's in your meeting book, maybe, uh, I'm sure somebody's going to put it in the to the chat as well. Um, and uh, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll yield the floor back to you. Uh, I believe that that is all we have to report. Um, other than I would I would uh, just say that the one thing that has come up um, that I got a, a uh, urgent message yesterday from the Tipo at uh, Bad River, and um, having a, a problem with an Enbridge Five line that has been rerouted, uh, but uh, that is uh, having some consultation issues on. So I believe it's a 404 permit. So to uh, just raise that awareness here that that, that issue exists, I uh, would ask uh, Ira to, uh, to follow up directly with uh, Edith the Tippo uh, and former chairwoman of, of, of Bad River uh, and, uh, and maybe kind of flush out a little bit more of the concerns. Um, but but Mr., uh, Mr. Vice Chair Colonel, Wanted to make you aware of that. Yeah, good. Yes, I've heard a lot about that, about Enbridge and, and that project. I think it's near the Straits of Mackinac. Uh, and uh, yeah, major, 
the major issue for sure. I'd love being updated on that too. It, it, it sounds like it's, uh, I think there's a lot of, been a lot of litigation or will be some litigation on that as well. Mm -hmm. um, okay. We uh, have a hand up from Reed. Oh, Just... sorry, Reed, go for it. Yeah, sorry, didn't see. That's okay. I, I would just say quickly regarding that training, something I said at yesterday's committee meeting, I'll say again, every single employee of the ACHP took the original version of that course, save those that have just come in the last couple of years. And every single employee of the ACHP will take the new revised course. So I just wanted to acknowledge our commitment to making sure our staff is trained in that regard and urge agencies and other organizations to think about committing their staff to taking it as well. It's really great training. Thanks. Great, great. Thanks. Thanks, Reed. Okay. Um, if there are no other items in Native American Affairs, let's move on to communications, education, and outreach. And uh, Luke, along with all of the other committees and committee chairs, I, I want to commend you on a, on a very, very excellent committee meeting. Just, just terrific. Uh, and if you could um, talk to us first about the whole um, series of webinars that the council has put together and perhaps what's what's planned for the future. Well, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, under the leadership of uh, Susan Glimcher and the OCEO staff, we had a lot of excellent discussion uh, during the first webinar series agenda item there. And OCEO took away many new ideas. Uh, one of these was adding a different focus for next year and starting to reach out not just to college age students, but uh, younger, younger age, high school and middle school students. And Ann Walker and Caroline Henry gave us good information with regard to groups to reach out to for these future possible webinars. Ann suggested the National History Day uh, contacts, organizations of homeschoolers, statewide preservation commissions and landmarks commissions, honors and gifted classes, uh, among others. Caroline spoke about the history department in an NHL listed school, Cranbrook, where her husband teaches in Michigan. They, there, they have incorporated a course on historic preservation, and we will be working with Caroline to create some kind of a pilot program to get our message uh, out to high schoolers. Caroline likes the idea of having ACHP members participate as a panel. Uh, she also floated the idea of structuring a student's, as they call it, a senior May uh, uh, with the ACHP and Cranbrook, either in person, in person or remotely. The students are not allowed to be paid, so no source of support is necessary to pursue this. It's a, it really boils down to being a three-week unpaid internship in May. The student could be identified from a, a fall class, perhaps the coming fall class enrollment, since their senior May proposals have to be identified, structured, and improved and approved by a Cranbrook senior May committee several months beforehand. Uh, I, I wonder, Caroline, do you have anything else you'd like to add to this? Thank you, Luke. I just think it's a, a really exciting opportunity. The class here uses Cranbrook uh, because it's an NHL as a great laboratory for historic architecture and architectural history instruction, but they do touch on historic preservation generally. And I think the council's broad perspective of that preservation is more than um, beautiful historic buildings uh, would be great exposure for the students as well. So um, I really look forward to exploring the opportunity further. Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, what I would report is, you know, of course, all these are sort of at the idea stage at the moment. And so we'll be taking these ideas and, and trying to create a plan to move forward. Uh, members also like the idea of uh, perhaps the ACHP providing curriculum, curriculum or giving input on curriculum for classes on preservation uh, at other kinds of schools. Uh, the, the idea came up about getting our partners together for a forum on historic preservation education and Reed Nelson and ACHP members offered numerous suggestions for who might be involved in this. Additionally, Stephanie Paul from NAPC suggested a toolkit that we could put together, including practical information for students. Uh, another new webinar that will be coming in the future soon is with the Office of Native American Affairs here at the ACHP on the subject of land recognition. And so, Mr. Vice Chairman, that concludes that item, and I can continue if there are no comments or questions well, at this point. Uh, actually, Luke, what I'd like to do 
is just to <laughs> thank you for uh, and the staff of CEO for your excellent work in securing an opportunity for us to share more about the council with C-SPAN's audience uh, and to uh, to ask you where you know where what other things might we consider as we go forward. Uh, it, it, personally, it was it was a very rewarding experience, and your uh, pathfinding work uh, and 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 opening that door to the council is is most appreciated. The team really came together. Everyone in the CEO pulled together, and um, it was really terrific. So thank you, thank you very much. And what's what's planned for the future, or what's out there? Well, you're very welcome. And I think if, if you have that mug in your hand, then you officially belong to the Club of History Nerds. So let me say, uh, and, and proud we are to be history nerds. Uh, well, you know, we had, um, uh, we, we, we've we already heard members here in our committee, we've talked about the, the excellent interview that you did uh, back in December that aired on C-SPAN, which if you've not had a chance to see that, it's easy enough to find. Uh, it's available for free to stream anytime you like on C-SPAN's video library. Um, I, I, I uh, uh, you know, so I reminded uh, members during our committee meeting uh, about our suggestion to build upon the experience of this interview and its success by pitching another show idea to C-SPAN in the future. This time we're looking at the potential of a viewer call-in program, uh, which C-SPAN has really become known for over, the, over its 40 years. Uh, members like the idea of having the new chairman, uh, Sarah, be the focus of the program whenever she's confirmed. Uh, C-SPAN uh, also has uh, probed the possibility and we discussed the idea of potential, potentially not just a single expert on camera, but perhaps a panel of experts as part of the call-in show. Uh, Ann Walker suggested getting students involved potentially in the panel, perhaps having even the site where the show might take place kind of as a backdrop to the, to the interview program could even take place at a, at a historic site where students uh, have done a project, a school project and suggested the newly minted NPS site at Amache as an example. The original work there was done by students. I know C-SPAN um, often likes to feature students. You know, they, they assume that all of us have day jobs and this is what we do for a living. So they love the energy and enthusiasm of young people who do this out of, out of passion and interest and not just those of us who, you know, we're gonna do this every day, you know, talking about and, and really uh, lobbying for, what it, for the value of what it is that we do. And I think that's also a good idea to pursue, kind of involving students as a theme somehow in this program. The, uh, uh, the CEO staff and I would also, of course, like to see members participating in these types of future media uh, outreach efforts. And uh, I would say additionally, one of our members suggested pitching perhaps even documentary, fil uh, documentary filmmaker Ken Burns production company perhaps a well thought out proposal encompassing the ACHP's work sec or section 106 success stories, which we focused on in the past and more could be presented to him as a possibility. It seems certainly in line with his past interest in, in history uh, and uh, his past documentary filmmaking work. And certainly if members have any comments or questions about any of these items, we'd be happy to address them. Uh, that concludes my report, Mr. Vice Chairman. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent, Luke. Thank you very, very much. Any, any questions for Luke? Comments? Okay. All right. Hearing none. Um, the next item is qu we can quickly go through. There's, that's the new business and there is no new business at this point. So um, let me, um, before I go into uh, uh, the next meetings, uh, dates, and, uh, and our adjournment, and we will give you some time back. Uh, let me just uh, take this opportunity to thank Reed uh, first for, for uh, all the advice, counsel, mentoring, assistance, our Tuesday morning regular meetings, <laughs> and always, always being there to, have, to help me through, uh, through and, and educate me through a number of areas, really appreciated. And the quiet partner, Javier, who is uh, <laughs> who popped up real quickly to remind me to, uh, to do some discussing and, uh, and properly do the motions. Javier, you're doing really appreciate. I know you're moving parts too back there and I really appreciate the work you've done. Um, let me um, also thank the staff for their work terrific staff having been a member uh it is a pleasure to to be associated with you in this capacity let me thank all of the 
members of the council for a wonderful meeting, for your participation, for your involvement, for your commitment, and for your passion uh, as we go through these very, very important meetings to paraphrase again what we say at the at the Holocaust Museum, what you do matters, and it certainly applies to this area. So moving on, um, let me just point out that uh, um, our next, we have two, we have a meeting set already for our next business meeting is, um, uh, let's see, uh, June 29th, I believe, uh, and, uh, and the one after that, October 26th. So right. June, June 29th right. and October 26th. And then usually, as you found out, the committee meetings take place the two days before. So are there any other items that folks would like to bring up in the military? You can get shot if somebody does it at this point and brings up something at this stage. Uh, but um, so I'm assuming the DOD probably won't bring it up, but any other uh, comments or questions before we adjourn about 10 minutes early? Jordan, you're doing a hell of a job, man. <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate you. I think we all do. Thanks. So, thank you. Thanks. Pleasure. Absolutely. All right, everyone. Enjoy your 10 minutes. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and we'll see each other again soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.